Is it on? <laughs> Great. Hello, everyone. Uh, actually, hopefully, uh, all of you had a very productive weekday. Some of you look sleepy too, but thanks for coming here. Uh, myself, Abhinav, uh, this is Douglas. Uh, today, we'll be uh, breaking up the talk. Like, uh, I'll be the one doing the talking, and he'll be one uh, answering your questions at the end of the talk. <laughs> <laughs> so wherever I mess up, like, I yeah, just talk to him. So before we kick off, like, uh, can we have a show of hand? Like, uh, how many uh, of you are actually doing production Go? Can you just like take a look? Well, oh, quite many actually. Uh, how many of you are just familiar with Go? Okay, cool. And uh, anybody who just doesn't know what Go is? <laughs> I mean, no, no shame, like, yeah, sure. Great, so uh, we will tailor the talk accordingly, I guess. So today we are here to talk about concurrency uh, in general and what, which primitives Go provide us to deal with it. So uh, it's going to be a very high level uh, dis, uh, talk, like it's not, it's not going to be anything in depth, uh, it's, it's a very general uh, view of concurrency. What we're going to talk about is uh, why we all love Go or hate it, I guess. Then uh, what concurrency is, what Golang provides in order to deal with concurrency. And then we'll have a short uh, deep uh, dive in code, so see that kind of like binds the whole talk together. Okay, where the fuck my cursor is? Where is it? So, uh, why Go? Well, uh, because Go was inherently designed to deal with uh, competitive pro processes that are uh, that are trying to acquire resources at the same point of time. Uh, in general, like what I'm trying to say is that Go is a language that is designed to handle concurrency. The, uh, I mean like we'll see uh, how later in the talk. The other thing that uh, probably very good about Go is that its syntax is really, really simple. It removes all the syntactic sugar that, uh, okay. What happened? So yeah, the other thing is that like, uh, it totally removes the syntactic sugar. Uh, it, it has uh, really nice cross compilation tools. Uh, it has the, uh, all the linting and formatting tools, all, all those uh, nice things built in. So what it gives us at the end of the day as a developer, it gives us the ability to write beautiful code that is easy to understand and maintainable in long term. So that's one of the reasons like why you should at least take a look uh, what Go is. Okay. Uh, the common use cases for uh, Go are services that don't require a lot of uh, complex business logic, or at least in my opinion. So the common use cases are something that don't require a lot of core business logic, but uh, it's more about fast decision making and like you know, uh, comp uh, doing a lot of things concurrently, I guess. So uh, the uh, at Gojek commonly we use it for the edge services like authentication service. Uh, web proxies, routing, uh, even like we uh, we have a nice project called Heimdall. So this kind of like uh, binds in all these good things that I discussed earlier about Go. Uh, it's a wrapper on uh, an HTTP client. Uh, it's a wrapper on Hystrix that provides you retry capabilities and circuit breaking and all that. Uh, other nice projects that are already there in Go is uh, Kubernetes, Docker. If most of you might already be aware of them. What the fuck? Where did it go? Sure, it keeps disappearing. Uh, sure, can I just go next? Like, yeah, technical problems as always. Yeah, okay, so, sure. Uh, what is concurrency? Uh, so uh, concurrency is essentially the concept of doing uh, multiple things within the same amount of time. Uh, what does that mean is, uh, 
Not, 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 not. Oh, okay. Copy bullet. Is it with your display? Up, down? Yeah, up. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. This means, uh, so uh, concurrency is more about like dealing with uh, doing a lot of things at the same amount of time. What that means is like being able to break down your task into smaller parts that can be executed out of order. So, uh, but the, whenever we talk about concurrency, what usually happens is a lot of the people think parallelism, which is a quite closely related topic, but it's a little bit different. Parallelism is about doing multiple things at the same time simultaneously. Concurrency is more about doing two things or multiple things within the same period of time, but you might necessarily not be doing them simultaneously. Uh, we have a like short example for that. So let's go to Bob. So Bob is our uh, ticket booth operator. His boss was like really angry at him and like, you know, that you are acting slow. So what he did is like he sort of like, uh, okay, instead of one queue, I will start working with two queues at the same time. So he was very ambitious. Uh, he started serving with uh, two queues at the same time. He decides to like, he decides who gets the ticket at what, in what order. So like these A, B, C and U, V, W guys. At the end of the day, everybody gets the ticket, but his performance was not improving. Why? Because there is only one Bob, no matter like it's a single queue or a single task or like two tasks with same amount of load. So his performance was essentially not improving. Instead it was more decreasing because he has to actually keep on deciding which one to serve, which one not to serve, say no to people, blah, blah, blah. Right. So then he came up with parallelism. So he hired Alice. So now we have Bob and Alice. We have two queues the amount of tasks reduced in half, right? So that is, that is the essentially difference between concurrency and parallelism. Like probably your, I got it through, I guess. Uh, next. Sure, so uh, Go. Uh, Go includes few things to support concurrency. So that's why we said that like Go is inherently concurrent. So first of thing is a Go routine. Go routine, you can imagine a light, lightweight process or a thread that you can use to achieve a small amount of tasks. The other thing is channels. So uh, whenever you are talking about concurrent processes or concurrent tasks, the, uh, usually since you are trying to do two things within the same period of time, you want a means of communication between the two. So that's what channel, uh, that's how uh, Go encapsulates this kind of communication medium in, in terms of channels. Then uh, there is something called a select. Select is I will talk more about select, but select is uh, something like a switch statement for channels. It helps us writing uh, non-blocking Go code. Yeah, I I'll talk like a little bit more later. And then there's like last thing that is sync package. So sync package provides, uh, this is the main, main utility package that provides uh, all the concurrency primitives that Go has like weight groups, atomics, ones. But um, uh, out of these four, we'll primarily be focusing on two of these. That is channels and select statement. Uh, probably like in some future talk, we'll cover the rest. So again, back to channels. So channels are something that connect concurrently executing codes, which is usually a Go code, Go routine. So uh, the beauty of channels is that they are typed. So if it's an integer type of channel, it will, it will always contain an integer. If it's a string type of channel or if it's a structure, that's another Go primitive. So it's going to contain exactly the same amount of information, uh, same type of information. So having a channel like ensures type safety. Channels have send receive semantics. So uh, in order to communicate between two Go routines, you'll always be sending from sending from a channel and receiving from a channel. Uh, you can actually uh, even quantify that a channel can is a send only or a receive only. So that helps you like avoid uh, people doing multiple uh, or trying to do multiple things on the same channel. Then the other thing is that uh, data is copied to and from a channel, which can be a good thing or a bad thing because uh, since data is being copied all over the place, so depending on like your amount of data, your memory footprint might be large if you know there are a lot of things or a lot of Go routines that are trying to copy it off the channel. Then, uh, sure. So uh, this is what a channel looks like. Uh, so okay. Uh, so this is a string type of channel. An arrow, uh, 
as I said, like Go has a very simple syntax. <coughs> so an arrow going in means you are pushing to the channel. An arrow going out of the channel means you are receiving from the channel. So there is no, no like really complex logic here. Uh, a channel, uh, a sending channel will be blocked until the message can be enqueued. And a receiving cha channel will be blocked until there is a message. The, uh, the, part, the top part, like until a message can be enqueued, is kind of important when we talk about channels, because channels can be of two types, a buffer channel and an unbuffered channel. Uh, what does a buffer mean here? So think of channel as uh, a passageway. Uh, and a buffer is kind of the size of that passage. In an unbuffered channel, you cannot really hold anything in the passage. So if I want to talk to Douglas, and there's nothing in between, so I'll be sending some information to Douglas. And until Douglas receives it, I am blocked. And yeah, Douglas is blocked. If I have a buffer in between, so let's say like, yeah, there's a table or table here that can hold a letter. So I want to talk to Douglas. I keep my letter. I go ahead and like do, continue doing my thing. Douglas can receive the letter whenever he wants to. And he can process that letter. But if the table has only a size of one, or like a fixed amount of size, so I can place only that many, cham that many letters. If the size was one, and I'm trying to like place two letters, then I'm blocked again. Right? So that's the sending blocking thing. Right? So well, blocking is bad. Like anybody can guess like why blocking is bad? Show of hands, or like, no? Come on, guys. Like, yeah, sure. Why? Right. It definitely introduces delays. The when we are trying to do concurrency, like we are kind of trying to optimize for time, I guess. What other things? Sure. So, uh, well, uh, the besides delay, like the why blocking is bad is because uh, it can introduce deadlocks, because th that can be of multiple reasons that uh, the two strings that are trying to do stuff, they are hogging resources, and like one, one is blocked, and it's not releasing, releasing resources. Other people need it. So that can be one thing. The other thing is like there are independent cascading uh, blocks that are happening, and that may result into a circular block that will in turn return, re result in a deadlock, right? So anything else I want to talk? So uh, the other thing is like, I mean, if something is blocking, then for, we are losing cycles. So we are, uh, we are lose, every cycle that we lose, we lose the cost of infrastructure that we, we devote to our software. So that's another, so blocking makes your software more expensive. Every cycle you lose, that can be well spent into doing something else that is non-blocking, right? So that's why we, uh, instead of having a blocking, cha blo blocking only mechanism, we, ha we have a select statement. So select kind of makes your channel non-blocking. Uh, by providing you an ability to wait on multiple channels at the same time. So what it does is that uh, it provides, uh, from a bunch of channels, you can, uh, whichever channels goes unblocking, you can do that first. So for example, like, again, same thing. I'm talking to Douglas and I'm talking to my friend here. Both of them are supposed to give me some message, but Douglas is very busy, he's free. So I can listen to both of them at the same time. Whoever gives me a message first, I can work on that faster. So that kind of gives me a sense of, uh, or that gives me a way to optimize my optimize for time and not being blocked forever for one thing. The other thing is that select provides is a default statement, so a default case in which if I'm blocked by everybody, I can do something by default. So I'm sorry, like I haven't put the syntax here. So that's how uh, select uh, select looks like. So it's very similar to a switch statement. In this case, like you are seeing the three things, sorry, this is, so uh, the first statement is a receive, the uh, first statement is a send, second is a receive, third is also receive, but like we are not using that value, it's, and the fourth is the default. So what happens is like, depending on who sends me, who gives me a response first, if uh, I get a response on channel one, then I receive a value and then I print that. If I receive a response, response on channel two, oh sorry, if I receive a response on channel one, I send that value. If I receive a response on channel two, then I say that I have received it. If, if I'm totally blocked, I'll just tell you like, you know, I'm blocked and like this whole cycle can repeat if it's inside a for loop. It doesn't repeat by default, okay? So that is the select example. Okay, let's talk code, I guess. That's what I'm a little bit better at. 
So uh, everybody with me until the, until now? Like nothing too complicated, I guess. Sure. So uh, today's uh, today's code uh, code deep dive is based around a toy example in which uh, we are trying to write uh, we are trying to optimize for time again. So we have uh, a data producer and uh, a DB sync. So we want to write data to our database, but we don't really want to wait for the write to finish. Uh, so, so yeah, let's take a look. Right, uh, you want to walk through the code? Uh, I mean, I'll control the Sure. So uh, here we have like uh, two, two of these constructs, like uh, data producer and, uh, and a DB sync. We, st we start listening, uh, sync starts listening to the producer. So whenever our data is produced, it goes to the sync. And uh, it's on the correct. And uh, yeah, producer is running, sync is running. So let's run this. Okay. So everything is nice and dandy. Like you know, uh, this is happening because. Uh, can we go inside the uh, producer? So this this all is happening because like we have a uh, we have a nice run here. Can you zoom in? Let me know when to stop. I, mean, I haven't heard stop yet. Like, yeah, continue zooming. Should be on. I don't know. We are, we are too close, right? Yeah, we are very close to the front row. Uh, okay, yes. I think it's okay. <laughs> yeah, like, dude, I'm, I'm running out of like screen space now. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, the main thing is happening is here is that uh, we, we did set up an interrupt handler for some reasons. We'll, we'll tell later. So, yeah, the the main thing is happening is here that uh, we continue producing data until the stop flag turns true, which will happen for some reasons later. We, uh, we simulate working here by d dot do something, and uh, once this si this simulation is finished, we write to the channel, which is a db. Uh, yeah, I guess I have I have skipped some part. Cool. So uh, let let's go to the uh, sync sync dot listen. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, so. Let me backtrack first. Huh? So, uh, as I was saying earlier, that the sync is listening to the data uh, to the data being produced by the producer. So, I guess we are okay. So, uh, here uh, here is the listen call. So, what happens here is that uh, when you uh, at this particular where is the ad worker? Yeah. Where's the where's the get handle? Get channel. Uh, Shit, man. Okay, so just just take my word for it. Like uh, we cannot find it, but. Uh, so d during listen, what happens is that we are we are trying to share a channel between the producer and the consumer, so that we have a, co a common way of communicating with each other. So that's why when during the yeah, yeah. oh yes, sure, sorry. So that's the place, right? So uh, during listen, what we are doing is uh, we have we have a set number of workers that we want to start. So that's like something that. We should always control that how many go routines you are going to spin up in a program. We should not like just spin up a go routine for every single task, otherwise it's gonna run run you out of the memory. So we spin up like a fixed number of workers. Whenever we are for, uh, we are spinning a worker, we provide it a channel that we will be using to communicate with it. So producer dot get channel gives it a receive only channel, so that uh, the during the start worker uh, during the start workers like yeah, get channel is giving you a receive only channel. So do, when when the worker starts, it can start listening on that channel. More on that later. So going back to the pr uh, producer, we see that we did some work, and now we are trying to write some data onto the channel. 
which is here. And we, we were having a, uh, so once this get, gets in, now in the DB writer uh, or, or in our DB sync, we are writing it to, yeah. So uh, our worker is receiving data from the channel uh, and then write to the database. So everything was ni nice and dandy, right? Now we, we, our database started freezing. Why? We had too much data in there. We, ha we had like really complex queries running in. Something happened. Kash Douglas, you're not running. Yeah. Cool. So we simulate like a, a lag by control C. Okay. So now we are seeing a jitter. Okay. Sorry. Uh, now we are seeing a jitter in the output because our database is freezing. That, that is happening because uh, our channel itself was inherently a blocking channel, uh, unbuffered channel. So every time we get, get the information, it waits until the, it's actually written to the database or actually it's being, it, it has already been at least read from the queue. Then yeah, still we are writing to the database separately from whatever we are doing. But uh, yeah, it's a, we have to at least block the producer until the data has actually been received by the D, uh, DB sync. So we can improve it a little bit by introducing the concept that we discussed earlier. So you, you see like every number that is increasing is like increasing by, should be increasing by one, but like, yeah, okay. So, so yeah, the, this, this thing can be improved a little bit by introducing a buffer channel, okay. So what we do here is like we, uh, our, when we can create the data, create our uh, producer, what we do is like we provide it a buffer size. So that will kind of decides the table size that we are going to have in center. So let's say like instead of zero, let's have a size of 10, okay? And then let's run it again, okay? So everything nice and dandy, we, we encounter the same kind of error again What? Okay. Again, a fail. So, uh, <laughs> what I was hoping to show you here is that uh, since the buffer size is large, so we are able to uh, write it faster. I mean, uh, we are we don't really have to be blocked until all the messages written. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry. Do, do we do we have the print statement for the producer? So the, uh, the reason that you are seeing this is because the DB sync is still writing with the lag. So whenever it writes, you see the output of the DB sync, but you are not seeing the output of the producer, which changes with the, with the change in size of the buffer. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's, let's reach the ideal situation that uh, where we want it to be. So uh, cancel it, dude. Yeah, just, just kill. Yeah, sure. So, uh, sure, sorry, yeah. Okay, sure. So, what we did to like uh, overall improve or change this blocking mechanism is to actually introduce the select. So uh, this kind of helps us to have some kind of failover strategy in, in the whole system. So in case like we have, we encounter like severe lag or severe, uh, yeah, severe lag or se uh, in the system or, or block, yeah. So severe lag or block in the system. So in that case, we have a failover strategy that doesn't really fail your application altogether. So here we have, we are doing something similar. But instead, we introduce the introduce the select, and whenever we are like really really blocked, which shouldn't happen in the usual usual scenario, so if we are really really blocked, we start writing to a separate thing, which is a Redis here. So we we run it like now we we introduce the lag, sure. So now you are seeing like in between, we are writing to the database as well as we are writing to the Redis whenever like the lag is too much. So it doesn't really re reduce your performance, but yeah, it continues to have this kind of thing, a uh, little bit failover in between. Let's say your database really goes down. So in that case, like uh, if we hit control C, yeah. Yeah, so 
now you see that everything is just directly going to the redis you still have a running service but like yeah, everything is right now in memory probably time to call prod support and like you know get your database up and running now let's assume that like everything worked and your prod support person uh, did the fix and whatever so you see that uh, we started writing back to the database because the uh, because the uh, this this particular block see the reason we are why we are writing to the database is this channel became full okay because we are not able to write to the database so the channel became full we started writing to the redis once the database came back up it started re uh, the our sync started reading again from the channel and then the channel became empty and we are able to queue more messages and that's how we are able to like fail back uh, like switch over to the, our original scenario without doing any additional deployments uh, additional redeployments to our main service of course like i mean uh, this it, this will include increase include some kind of tech debt or some kind of dependency that you have to migrate your data between redis and whatever but uh, it, it's it's a it's a really toy example right uh, this is uh, what we are trying to show here is that in case there is a there is a failure in your system in uh, in a concurrent system the uh, using select and default can provide you a way to kind of degrade into a less uh, less serviceable condition but when once you recover you can like fa uh, fail over back without any issue okay so that's all for the demo part of it so uh, let's talk about like one last topic that is when not concurrency okay so uh, we all know like you know that concurrency uh, let, let's switch to concurrency and concurrency will uh, increase our chances of uh, increase of performance time and blah 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 i guess but uh, when do you guys think that we should not be concurrent again like any guesses sequential processing correct sequential processing anything else okay so uh, so uh, concurrency is like really useful under two circumstances when you have a mix of io and cpu bound tasks or you have enough hardware to run run uh, enough enough hardware to run tasks in parallel w what i mean by that is like see for example let's take the first case okay uh, we, uh, we we have a task of calculating pi uh, that's like just we have a we have a bubble sort okay so or we have any any particular sort For, forget bubble sort so sorting is inherently io bound task right and we have only a single processor now uh, we can definitely break uh, a sorting algorithm like merge sort into uh, into tasks that can be run parallelly and independently but it's always going to be you can always you are always going to do one thing at a time there is no blocking but you will lose time during context switch so whenever like you are trying to run multiple uh, uh, very high io bound task a uh, high cpu bound task concurrently on a single processor machine it's going to cost you more time in uh, in another example can be like just a series uh, a sum of array okay that's like the simplest i can get here so a sum of array okay uh, it doesn't really matter in which order you sum the numbers it's going to be always the same thing right so you can write a write a nice go routine that sums your uh, sums all your numbers in parallel but you only have one one single processor so in that case also like uh, if you are trying to like you know spin up a, lo a lot of go routines and trying to do it it will not give you any any better performance like than a single processor like uh, try to do it like uh, on a benchmarking system it will fail but the same thing will work nicely if you have multiple cores so if you have a four core or eight core system so since like all this addition is act actually happening in parallel so it's well and good the other thing would be uh, a high io bound task and a cpu bound task so if you have a combination of these two so yeah you can spin off at least two go routines one dedicated to io one dedicated to cpu so whenever the io is blocking your, your other go routine is actually utilizing the cpu time so that's about it i guess questions and douglas sure thank you yeah Uh, sorry, one sec. <laughs>
Alright. Uh, could you repeat that, please? Uh, when is suitable? Mm -hmm. Just go routine. Mm -hmm. And okay, let's say I just want to run something in parallel. I don't really care about concurrency. So when is suitable for go routine and when is suitable for queue? Using that party queue, queue engine. Uh, using a queue, so you mean an external queue to yeah. to the system? Yeah. Can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, maybe you should just do it, uh, do it on the mic. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the question is, when is uh, to, to, let's say I want, I want to run something in parallel, mm -hmm. not really concurrent. Uh, when is when when what is scenario is suitable for go routine and what is scenario suitable for using third party queue engine? Okay. So. Uh, it, it, it's a little different, okay? So you would think of concurrency as more of a design problem, right? It's not just because I want to do things in, in parallel. And the reason you would probably use an external queuing system is because A, you have shared consumers to that queue, right? You have a shared consumer to that queue, right? So you have many instances, let's say, of your application list to, to an external system, right? So I, I don't think that the, the two really com compare to each other. For, for example, like one thing you could do is uh, you could have... For, for example, let's say, let's take Kafka, right? Like I'm producing messages and I have workers consuming them, right? But I don't want to keep my messages in process. Okay, uh, let's say I want to process a report. So it might take five minutes. So it's, it's exactly, right? So because, uh, okay, let's say even if you have a buffer channel, you will have this buffer in memory. If that process goes down or, you know, or that, you know, uh, let's say your running container gets rescheduled, you're going to lose that, right? So essentially you want an external system that abstracts this this queuing from 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 your logic of of working on the task right this is primarily when i would use an external system right but concurrency is more about design see within my system i can still design concurrent systems to 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 be let's say object oriented for example right i could use some observer pattern or something or use callbacks for example to to really orchestrate this behavior so i think of concurrency as more of using these primitives to like design your core as sequences of independent tasks Right now, when these tasks need to coordinate within something that needs to be persistent, is is a different design choice. It it, it drives more into architecture than you know your low level implementation. Right. So yeah, I I mean like it, it would vary a lot. Like for for simple message, like if I just want to communicate between two functions, let's say I'm not going to use an external queue. Right. It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. I mean, is is, is that like I I I'm sorry. Like was that clear? Like I'm not sure. So the point is only persistent. Uh, persistence and like sharing, yeah, if you want to share between processes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, just, just to like, you know, break it down, that Douglas is a very technical guy here. <laughs> okay, so uh, back to your question, like, uh, you have a report mm -hmm. that you want to be analyzed, right? Uh, this uh, analysis can be done by multiple consumers, like multiple people. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if the analysis of the whole report it's not atomic thing. Like it, it, it can be, It needs to be analyzed by, in part, the multiple people, and these people are outside of your own main thing, right? Main process, main task. So in that case, yeah, definitely you 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 would need a queuing mechanism, because you want to distribute this analysis task to different people, right? You don't want to do this analysis by yourself faster. By go routine, so can do that. Yeah, but go routine, go routine cannot distribute it to other processes. Okay. I mean, you mean technically it can. Oh, other machines. So, you want to do it for other machines, no, right? No, no. Uh, uh, what, what do you mean by other percent? Is it machine or? Uh, it's other. So if other run times, essentially. In in top, so, yeah. So go routine scheduling is still within a single like go runtime or a single CPU. If you can imagine as, as a single CPU system, right? It's not like you can. There might be implementations it's where host. where you uh, exactly right. There might be implementations where you know I have a go routine and it's producing to a socket, and then you know on my other side I have another go process running. It could be a clone of the same one that has a consumer reading from from a socket, right? And I could simulate the same thing using go routines, like yeah, over the over the queue. But why would you have an external queue, right? It's an expensive operation if you're just sending something simple. It's only if you need you know to maintain that data external to your process so that you're not dependent on your instruction point execution. You know, to to maintain the state of that, right? Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. yeah. Okay. Why? <coughs> yeah. Um, nice presentation, by the way. Thank you. Why do you choose to abstract uh, 
in a producer consumer fashion mm -hmm. rather than exposing channels. Uh, is it for your user? I just wanted to find out your reasons for doing that. Oh, uh, okay. Sure, you want to take this? Probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it, it was actually uh, more for uh, coming up with an actual use case than rather just discussing channels. Channels in isolation is uh, is very typical topic, but like unless we are digging, taking a deep dive in channels, channels in, uh, like at, at this level, just talking about channels didn't make uh, made a lot of sense to me. Rather than like writing up some kind of use case or some kind of for example, so that's why I uh, wrap it around uh, in a producer and say. So, but do you use this in your production code? Yeah. Uh, uh, kind of pattern. Uh, sure. So, in in general, like you know, it, when we talk about clean code, you would like to hide that that uh, implementation detail under some interface, right? Uh, for for example, let's say uh, f not not just channels, right? Let's say if internally I use an array or a linked list or or a hash map to to do some state storage, uh, I wouldn't really want to expose that structure to anyone consuming it, right? I would always do it through an interface so that the behavior can be you know verified as a black box and then I can unit test it through that interface or you know I could like you know verify the state through that interface so that's one of the reasons like I mean I mean this, this could be a very debatable thing but I like hiding the implementation details under a clean, clean interface so that even if that changes your consumers don't really have to do any rework right like just expose functions all right uh, what was this with uh, interrupts signal handling Oh, it was just to simulate, like we needed a way to trigger the lag, so we just use an interrupt to, 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 to simulate it, essentially. Uh, like, yeah, I, or we could have just you know, put a timer or something that would keep getting slow. But essentially just to run that simu simulation. Yeah. Uh, there was a question at the back. Or, 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 or like if you have a loud voice, you can shout. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> sure. Alright, uh, my question comes in two parts. The first sure. part is, Okay, so on quite a high level, uh, yeah. how per pervasively used is GoLang in GoJack? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. Two, uh, one of the criticisms I've heard right, about Go is mm -hmm. that because it's a relatively new language, a lot of libraries are not as battle tested as, say, the, uh, the more popular languages like Java or C. Okay. So, from your experience, right, how true is that criticism? Sure. Uh, okay. So about Go at Gojek, right? So I mean, as you heard from 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 the presentation or, or you know the video at the start, we we do use Go very heavily, right? We have one of the largest Go clusters around. To be honest, uh, what we use it for mostly is uh, more I/O bound, you know, and like things like proxies or, or gateways that have high throughput I I/O. Uh, in I I don't know if I should say this, but like yeah, in in my experience, like Go is a very simple language, right? You, you don't get a lot of syntax out of the box. And this makes it a little more verbose than if you're used to a more higher level language than Go. Uh, so we try to, you know, when, when things start to get too complicated, like it's, it's nicer to use a, a, a more higher level language as it gives you constructs, you know, which can abstract nicer. Uh, but coming to your second question, right? Like about Go being not, I, I think Go is pretty battle tested. Uh, I mean, like if you look at a, a, a lot of large software, right, run, runs reliably with Go, Docker or Kubernetes, for example. You know, it, it, it it's definitely like one of the the main things out there. Uh, the ecosystem is, yeah, it, it has a lot of varying libraries and frameworks. So you have to pick and choose what you want. It's not like something like Java where there's an obvious choice, you know, on what to go for. Uh, but you generally that each of each library or or frame, I'm not going to say, there are very few frameworks, but each library has a nuance. Like it's intended for a very specific purpose and you would generally read the design principles and, and pick pick what you want. Uh, I haven't found it lacking anywhere. Like there's really no, at least for our use cases, we haven't really found the need to really re reinvent something. Of course, Hamdall is something that we, we use heavily internally into Gojek just because uh, by default, the Go HTTP client, you know, d doesn't do some things like timeouts and retries. So just to wrap it and make it reusable, that's why we, we, we write some wrappers around those things. Yeah, but that, that's about it. But yeah, there's nothing really lacking in Go at the moment. So you guys didn't actually have to test the libraries? Oh, oh, not really, no. Uh, yeah. Just make it as correct as this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no. I think you need to make the differentiation between standard library and the party library. The, oh, that, that's actually a very good point. So the standard libraries in Go, 
um, are really really nice right like you you get HTTP out of the box you even get like uh, sockets out of the box for example you get like image processing out of the box hashing out of the box even the test libraries out of the box right so for things like that like yeah I, I would trust that blindly third party libraries yeah uh, you can never be too sure right but and there's always open issues on github that you can look at or you know the number of stars or the contributors with their reputation so yeah picking third party libraries is a little tricky but i don't think that it's like much of a problem yeah well, that's with any language. I, I don't think that's that's the go issue, right? Like, like yeah, if you've looked at Node, like yeah, that's like yeah, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and always, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, hello. Hi. No. He's dead. Oh, really? Just just shout out. Okay, oh. maybe I'll just shout out. Okay. Yeah, yeah sure. Good. Okay, so. Yeah, working now. <laughs> it's okay, so um, the first question would be, uh, I think on that note, I'd just like to ask because I'm not really developing Go and mm -hmm. I'd just like to be introduced to it anyway. So, uh, how do you think the error handling mechanism within Go is? Is it like, do you think is it... Uh, That's a very opinionated <laughs> question. <laughs> well, uh, I don't know, I don't it's horrible so and wonderful at the same time. <laughs> True. Yeah, uh, I have a short answer for that. Yeah. Uh, so, it's verbose and explicit. It works. Yeah, but it's ugly, right? Like, but it works. Like, you're, you're going to make less mistakes with it than you would with 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 a lot of other ways of like, like except throwing exceptions and things like that, because it's very explicit. Uh, but yeah, it's not the prettiest of syntax, to be honest. And uh, our second question, I think invariably when oh. you're uh, talking about uh, uh, concurrency, you end up with the issue of uh, synchronization. Mm -hmm. So, and with synchronization, one of the methods of handling is. A semo using a semaphore. Okay. So, um, how uh, do you, how, how good are the? Um, uh, okay. So, this is like a, a larger topic with like log free and wait free programming, right? But essentially, how Go so solves the the coordination or the synchronization problem, or I would say the orchestration problem, to be honest, when you have concurrency, is by communicating. Uh, between between concurrently executing channels. What this means is you never really share state, right? Because if you see the semantics of a channel, you put data on it, data is copied onto it, and your receiver pulls data. And the very primitive mechanisms that you have to coordinate is send and receive. So by using these, you can like you can limit yourself to a design which doesn't rely on any shared locks at all. So you you, you don't you do not you do not really need uh, like you know. Uh, any semaphores, for example, for, for very simple designs. Uh, there are some cases where the channel mechanism is an overkill, and which is why Go has the sync library in, 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 uh, in the standard library. So do you, you do get like uh, things like wait groups. Uh, if you look at the, the code, we'll post a link to it later. But we do use wait looks, or you have atomic operations like you know, to co compare and swap, or you know, if you really want to you know, use them. And, the, and they're CPU primitives, really. Uh, but in my experience, using them is generally an anti-pattern unless you're really, really optimizing. Okay, like, yeah, yeah. Be because you, you generally, uh, again, like, when you're locking, you have shared state. And managing that is difficult. See, concurrency or parallelism by itself is not so bad. It's when you share the state and managing that, that's when it gets tricky. When you have a shared mutable. Exactly. Uh, yeah, even if it's not mutable, you might just end up in a deadlock, right? Like, you're blocking on something shared. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, sure. Yeah. Uh, how are we doing on time, actually? We're doing okay. Okay, cool. Is there any, uh, are there any numbers or any comparison uh, with respect to both channels and routines against multi threaded uh, applications using Java? Like, was there, uh, how much of a throughput uh, was better or was there better CPU utilization? Have you come across anything like that or have you done anything like that? Uh, yeah. Well, uh, I can't really point you to the specific numbers, but yes, the footprint of a Go routine is way less than a footprint of a thread. Okay, for a Go routine, uh, Go routine's footprint is just the stack size. That's over it, I think. Like, yeah, yeah. it's very, very light. So, yeah, it's, it's it, like yeah, Java threads nowhere, nowhere compares to come close to it. Right. But uh, yeah, I really cannot like point, point you to specific numbers or like we haven't really done a testing because um, other people have already died for us. 
Right. Right. Uh, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, j just to add a little bit on that. So Go routines are not really threads. Okay. They are, they are like processes maintained within the Go runtime. So the OS never sees a Go routine. Unlike in Java, a thread is a native resource that's that's scheduled by the JVM and then by by, by your OS. So yeah, you can. It's common to spin up thousands of Go routines. Like that. That's not un uncommon. Uh, about performance, I think it it really matters with what you're doing with them. Right. Like. A, a native thread could perform better in some cases, but but like yeah, in in general, you would use Go routines more as an orchestration strategy or a design strategy rather than just for performance. I think the performance thing comes later. Yeah, uh, there was another question. Um, I think earlier in the talk and during one of the questions, you did mention that um, Go can become a bit more verbal quite verbal then when such things happen like you might like and uh, like as you uh, you might want to use the higher level language. Mm -hmm. Um is it out of like a development effort or is it something like a technical issue like a okay. yeah. Uh. yeah. Uh, it, it, it's more of a people problem, okay? Like this is with, with most programming languages. See, in the end you want your code to be maintainable over time. Like I, I don't want uh to and, and when you have an idea, you want to express it very cleanly with your with your syntax. If the language blocks you from doing that, that's when it's kind of time to step away. If it's if it's hard for people to read, like you know, like a lot of if elsees and and yeah, if error not nils and and these sort of things get in your way, then I think it's time to kind of step back and see like where can you separate the the two. Uh, it's it's definitely not a technical problem. Okay, like you can you can do everything with Go that you can with any other language. It's just that yeah, you might like get really frustrated and cry yourself to sleep in between or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so if then it's the case, say um, you want to move away from Go and like, like okay, so maybe the application has a part. Uh, maybe the project has a part of the logic where you actually require concurrency and mm -hmm. the performance is required, and the other part that they don't need. Mm -hmm. So I suppose Go we try to separate those parts. Is it? Uh, uh, definitely. In in general, it's a good idea to separate when your scaling requirements are different, right? So if you have like a scaling requirement for let's say one part of your project, and you have this other logic that is you know is not so intense, you know maybe it's it's just doing like so, some lightweight computations. Uh, in general, it would be good to scale not just because of the maintenance perspective, but also because of your infrastructure cost, right? Like I wouldn't want to take that whole thing and replicate it everywhere if i can just scale one part and get a boost in performance right so in, in, it's a it's a good idea to separate it in general but yeah i think what what we consider is like 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 i said most of our use cases at least so far that we've been in gojek has been things like like proxies or or you know like things that are do authentication for example where you have a gateway and it quickly needs to verify something and then reroute requests and things go, go works amazing in that and it's very easy to design that as well in go because you can think in terms of its primitives, like d doing the same thing in a language like Java, a little more work. Yeah, cool. Sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so like, so we did separate uh, when when you are separating, we uh, I suppose you will uh, like introduce like uh, some overhead, like you need to put them together. Like, say it's a new service, then it's a. Mm -hmm. Over. What's the? It's not really go go question, but what's yeah. the project of like handling of this? Like how do you? So I I mean like let 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 yeah let's just say it right like you're talking about how do you split an application into microservices or something like that right how do you it, it's a whole other talk and I, I like I, I'm not sure if it's relevant here but there are strategies for that right like you could like front it with a gateway and then redirect requests and you know or, or like yeah. Let, but, but but let's talk offline more. Yeah, I think we do have some experience with that. No, not so relevant here. Yeah, cool. Uh, any other question? Oh, okay. <laughs> please, please, yeah, yeah, pl oh, sure. Yeah, so what to say that? Uh, how do you visualize or lock the channel? Yeah, is it uh, full? Yeah, I mean, you want to visualize to for debugging so uh, the channel. Uh, so I, I didn't get the question. Like. Uh, if you're if you're debugging channel, channel is not something that doesn't doesn't really have attributes. So channel does have a, enough information about it to tell you like what is the buffer size is how how, how uh, is it, how much queue has been filled, how much it is empty. So when you actually go into the uh, into the debugger mode, like you can actually see all of that information. So you don't really have to just imagine 
like how or what is the current state of my channel is it really blocking like yeah, it, it's nice enough to tell you okay yeah so sure, uh, thanks for listening to us yeah. hope we got something thank you sure. okay i think now we can have